This brings us to an interesting dilemma. I have stressed several times that uh, one of the big advantages that the Cardano EUTX U model has over something like Ethereum is the fact that validation can happen in the wallet. So as I explained before, transactions can still fail because a transaction can consume an input that when the transaction arrives on the blockchain at the node for validation uh, has already been consumed by somebody else. But in that case, the transaction simply fails without um, having to pay fees. But what can never happen or should never happen under normal circumstances is that a validation script runs and then fails because you can always run the script under exactly the same conditions in the wallet already. So you see that it would fail before you ever submit it. And that is uh, very important and a very nice feature. But if you think about it, it's not clear how to um, manage time in that context. Because time is obviously important because we want to be able to express validation logic that says that a certain transaction is only valid after a certain time has been reached or before a certain time has been reached. And if you think about that, that seems to be a contradiction because uh, time is obviously flowing. So it, when you try to validate a transaction that you're constructing in your wallet, the time that you do that in the wallet can of course be different to the time that the transaction arrives at a node for validation. So it's not clear how to bring these two together to on the one hand handle time, but on the other hand, guarantee that uh, validation is deterministic in the sense that if it if and only if it succeeds in the wallet it will also succeed in the node and the way cardano solves that is by adding this posix time range field tx info valid range field to a transaction and what that specifies so it's uh, we will look at that type in detail in a moment but basically it, it gives a valid time interval. It, it is a time interval. So it says this transaction is valid between this and that time. And that is specified in the transaction. And now when a transaction gets sent to the blockchain, submitted to the blockchain and validated by a node, then before any scripts are run, um, some general checks are done. For example, that all the inputs are present and that the balances add up and so on, that the fees are included. Um, and one of those checks that happens before validation is that the time range is checked. So when a node is validating, one of these pre-checks pre before validation is the node checks the current time and compares it to the time range specified in the transaction. And if the current time does not fall into this time range, then validation fails immediately without ever running the validator scripts. But that also means that if these pre-checks succeed, then we can assume that the current time does fall into this interval. And then validation is completely deterministic again. This is just a static piece of data attached to the transaction. So the result of validation does not depend on when it is run, whether it's run in the wallet before submission or in one of the nodes when validating a transaction. And this makes it possible to resolve this apparent contradiction between having deterministic validation on the one hand and taking time into account on the other hand. So the trick is to do the time check before validation is run. And then during the execution of the validator scripts, we don't have to worry about it anymore. And we can just assume that the current time falls into this interval. Because if it wouldn't, then validation wouldn't even run in the first place, because then validation of the transaction would have failed before. By default, all transactions use the infinite time range that starts the beginning of time or at the genesis block and lasts for all eternity so such transactions will always be valid no matter at what time they arrive at a node for validation there's one slight complication with this 
And that is that Ouroboros itself, the consensus protocol powering Cardano, doesn't use POSIX time, time, it uses slots. So it counts slots and um, each slot, this lottery happens where a slot leader is determined and that slot leader can produce a block and so on. So slot is the native measure of time in Cardano. But Plutus uses real time. So somehow this has to be converted. So we need to be able to convert back and forth between real time and slots. And this is no problem as long as the slot length is fixed. Right now it is one second. So right now it's easy to go back and forth between real time and slot numbers. But this could change in future. So there could be a hard fork some parameter change that um, would change the slot time. And of course, we can't know that in advance. That um, may be a decision that is made years in the future. So we don't know right now what the slot length will be in 10 years, for example. And that means that slot intervals, specified transactions, mustn't have a definite upper bound um, that is too far in the future. It must only be f f as far in the future as it is possible to know what the slot length will be. And that happens to be something like 36 hours. We know what the slot length will be in the next 36 hours. Because if there is a hard fork, if there is a change in protocol parameters, then we know that at least 36 hours in advance. So that is something to, to keep in mind. You can't specify arbitrary time ranges there in the transaction interval. It must only be at most 36 hours in the future, or it can be indefinite. So for all eternity, that's also fine. It's important to note that this only applies to the transaction itself, not to Pluto scripts or validators. So in the transaction itself, if I set a definite upper bound for the time, it mustn't lie too far in the future. But in a Plutus contract, I can mention arbitrary dates. So I can easily have a Plutus contract where something has to happen or can't happen before a point of time 10 years or 100 years in future. So for example, I could have a Plutus script that allows a certain transaction only until 10 years into the future. So I can spend the UTXO with a certain redeemer only until 10 years into the future. This is certainly possible. However, what's not possible is to issue a transaction now that has a validity interval where the upper bound lies 10 years in the future. So in this specific example, I could either issue the transaction now, but then choose a upper bound of the validity interval, which is much closer, maybe just a couple of hours in the future, or I would need to wait 10 years or nine years and a couple of days until I'm close enough to this deadline of 10 years and then issue the transaction. So the whole point is to allow Pluto's contracts to be long running, to cover or mention points that are very far ahead because it's certainly realistic that we have contracts like that, that we want to have something to happen years or decades in the future. And we know that blockchain is changing, is evolving. Cardano is evolving and getting new, new features. And it's certainly conceivable that this slot length of one second will change in future, that there will be hard forks that change this. And if we in Plutus contracts just worked with slots, then it would be impossible to predict which point in time corresponds to which slot number. So by using this mechanism to use real time in Pluto scripts and to convert between slots and real time and making sure that that will always work no matter what hard forks do to the slot length, we get the best of both worlds. So let's look at this POSIX time range type in a bit more detail. And we'll see it's just a type synonym for interval POSIX time. 
So POSIX time is um, the number of milliseconds that have passed since the 1st of January 1970. And interval, which is defined in plutus.v1.ledger.interval, is something that has a lower bound and an upper bound. You can check. So a lower bound is an extended A and closure. Closure is just Boolean. So that says whether that bound is included in the interval or not. And extended can be just an A or negative infinity or positive infinity. And the same is true for upper bound. So if you check upper bound, it's also an extended A and this closure argument. So an interval has a lower bound and upper bound. Both can be negative infinity, positive infinity, or a specific value. And both can be included in the interval or not. But we will only use that for the case where A is POSIX time, so number of milliseconds since 1970. And if we look a bit further in this module here, see there are interesting functions that we can use. So for example, we can check whether given A is a member of the interval. We can construct an interval where both lower and upper bound are included in the interval. From is the interval that starts at A and goes to positive infinity. To is the interval that starts at negative infinity and stops at A. Always is all of time, all the values are in the interval. Never is the empty interval. Singleton is an interval that only contains that one specific element. Hull is basically the union of two intervals. But of course, the union of two intervals is not automatically again an interval. So this is the smallest interval that contains both this interval and that interval. Intersection is self-explanatory. So it's the intersection of two intervals. Overlaps tells you whether two given intervals have a non-empty intersection. Contains says whether the first interval contains the second one. So every element in the second one is also in the first one. Is empty, checks whether an interval is empty. Before and after says whether this given time is before everything in this interval or after everything in this interval. And you can construct lower and upper bounds that are exclusive and inclusive, respectively. To get a feel for intervals, let's play a bit with them in the REPL. Let me import the module where they are defined. And for simplicity's sake, let's not use POSIX time as our interval elements, but integers instead. So for example, I can define interval like this. So that's the interval from 10 to 20. You see the lower bound is 10 inclusive, the upper bound is 20 also inclusive. Now we can do membership tests. So for example, 8 is not included, 10 is, so is 15. So is 20, but 21 is no longer included. So let's define a second one. For example, from 15. And we can intersect those. And we get the interval starting at 15 and ending at 20. We can ask whether one contains the other. No, and also not the other way around, but they overlap. We can do the same with two. Let's define k as two seventeen. So the intersection of that with our original interval starts at ten and goes to seventeen. 
to get an example where actually one interval contains another. You can, for example, say contains i interval from 12 to 19. That is true. To 20, it's still true. But to 21, it's no longer true. But of course, they still overlap. So now let's look at an example for using this time range.